Hello there. And um, we're going to pick up where we left off in the equine nursing module, which was we looked at a lameness examination the last day. And we're going to move on now and look at some of the further diagnostic tests we might do to try and figure out what's going on with a lame horse. So I hope you're all keeping well, uh, not too bored at home yet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make these video recordings available to you on Moodle so you can watch them. If you have any questions, I'll put up a dedicated um, thread on the Moodle forum. So if a question occurs to you while you're watching the video or studying the content, please put your question on that thread. That way, when I reply to it, everybody else can see the answer as well. So it'll keep us all on the same page. Same as if you ask a question in class, everybody gets to hear the answer. It also means I'm not replying to the same question several times via email. So I think it'll just make it more efficient for all of us. Okay, so talking about equine regional analgesia, um, this is basically a series of diagnostic tests we'll often perform in practice. The reason being is that if we have an animal with a, with a painful limb, we can't ask them, where does it hurt? So unlike humans, where they can point out the painful area with our patients, we can figure out from a lameness examination which limb or which body part is painful, for example, but we still don't precisely know what anatomical structure is involved. So this is where um, analgesia can become very useful. So when we talk about regional analgesia or nerve blocking, what we're talking about here is using our anatomical knowledge to provide anesthesia of a specific structure or structures in the body. It's widely used in equine practice so that if, for example, the horse has foot pain and we put some local anesthetic around the nerve supplying that part of the foot and the horse goes from being lame to being sound, then we know that the pain is coming from that area we've just blocked with the local anesthetic. It's something that um, is widely done and nurses play a key role in performing this technique correctly and safely. So we'll go on and have a look at how we do it. In terms of um, what it's used for, there's lots of reasons. So we've mentioned already trying to pinpoint what part of the body is lame, but it's also very useful. If you take, for example, this picture of a cut here, we've got a wound on the medial aspect of the left metatarsophalangeal joint of a horse, and you can see it's fresh. It's an ideal candidate to be sutured. We don't really want to help to give the horse general anesthetic if we can avoid it because of the risks associated with that. At the same time, if we just sedate the animal, it's going to be too painful to safely lavage or treat or clean or suture this wound. So instead, what we can do is we can inject some local anesthetic either into the skin edges or into the nerves supplying this area to numb it. And then we can safely and humanely treat this wound without giving the horse general anesthetic. So that's, that's one example. Um, another one here we've mentioned already is trying to localize the source of pain in a lameness examination. And we can also use this technique as um, an adjunct to analgesia or pain relief during general anesthesia. So for example, during orthopedic fracture repair like this, as well as giving the horse general anesthetic, we can also provide regional analgesia to numb the nerves in the area that's been operated on. That will reduce wind up and painful stimulation to the central nervous system during an anesthetic. So it gives us a safer anesthetic. It's multimodal analgesia. We don't need to use as much anesthetic agent to keep the animal anesthetized. The whole procedure becomes um, much safer and less stressful for all concerned. We can also use this technique to perform some minor standing surgeries. So this is a horse with a cyst in his saddle region. Um, he's sedated, he's in the stocks, and we've injected local anesthetic into the cyst area before removing it. So it makes the procedure quick and safe. We're avoiding the risk of general anaesthetic. We're also avoiding the horse having to get back up to his feet after being anaesthetized. Where this wound is, once we suture it, after the cyst is removed, the skin will be quite tight. And if the horse is recumbent and has to get back up, there's a good chance that the um, sutures would tear. So it's a very useful um, technique for a lot of di different techniques in practice. In terms of where we can put the local anaesthetic, we basically have several options. We can inject it onto or around the nerves, that's called perineural anesthesia. That will then desensitize the area innervated by that nerve. We can inject it into a synovial structure, usually into a joint. It could also be into a tendon sheet, so that's called intrasynovial, and that will give us pain relief to the structures inside in the joint capsule or within that synovial tissue. We can direct directly injected into a lesion. So for example, into the edges of a skin wound to allow us to suture it or into tissue that we want to biopsy, for example. We can also do a ring or a field block. So rather than swelling up the tissue we want to handle or 
um, treat by injecting it with local anesthetic, we can put a ring or a field block around the area that we want to work on and that will desensitize it without distorting the tissue we want to work on. An example of this would be you can do a cesarean section in a cow by either injecting local anesthetic directly into the incision site, which would be direct anesthesia, or we can desensitize the nerves that supply the muscles of the flank and the skin at the level of the lumbar vertebrae, which would be a field block. And we've mentioned already suture and wounds, so we can inject local into or around a wound to allow us to treat it without the animal being discomforted by the procedure. So why would you do it? Um, we've mentioned already the need for general anaesthetic being risky, so we can reduce that by using this technique. It's also less expensive, it's faster, we're not using as much equipment or consumables. Um, we can use it to balance out multimodal anaesthesia or analgesia models. So we mentioned, for example, having a smoother general anaesthetic if we desensitize the area we're operating on. It may help us to figure out exactly what is wrong with the animal. So in a lameness examination, it can help pinpoint the specific structure that's causing the discomfort. Um, problems with it? Sounds great, but there are some advantages. The obvious one is if you take a lameness examination in a lame, otherwise healthy animal, they're not sedated because you want them to trot. And what we're saying to, the, to you is you have to stick a needle into this animal's uh, hind limb, for example, repeatedly. And there's obviously a risk of getting kicked that goes with that. So it can be, can be hazardous for the people involved. Um, we're also sticking a needle through skin into tissue. So there is a risk of infection. Um, it's low, but it's still there. Occasionally the needle might break. That's problematic if, we, if the hub of the needle snaps off and the needle tip is left in the tissue. And it does take time. We mentioned already that a lameness examination is not something you want to start at four o'clock in the evening particularly if you're going to do nerve blocks. Once you start, you have to methodically work your way up the limb and it can take several hours. So it's definitely something you want to allow plenty of time for. Okay, what do you need? Um, I've put a list in the lecture notes. The, a lot of it is fairly self-explanatory. You need some means of restraining the horse. You need um, something to clean the skin with and to clean your own hands and protect the animal from your flora before you start. So disposable gloves. Then we're talking about suitable size needles and syringes and an intra um, an anesthetic solution which won't be too irritant. So one that's widely used is um, mepivacaine. You can see it here as it's sold in Ireland as intra epicane which gives us a duration of action of two to three hours. So it's quite long acting relative to lidocaine or lignocaine which you may have seen used for example to, to dehorn cows. The other advantage of this solution is it comes in these small vials and um, 10 or 20 ml vials so we can open a new vial every time we want to, for example, inject a joint. We don't want to be recontaminating or reusing vials if we're going into a synovial structure. So this solution is suitable. You can see from the label, it's a veterinary practitioner only product. So it's not something we're going to be supplying to clients. It's for use within the hospital care team only. Um, in terms of clipping, there's debate over this. There's been several studies showing that the most important part of the preparation is to aseptically clean the skin and whether or not you clip the hair coat is less important. That said, um, it does slightly reduce the risk of infection. Now you have to do a lot of horses to make that significantly different statistically, but it's still slightly lower risk. And it also aids in locating the correct injection site, particularly if the horse is a very thick um, hair coat. So in general, you'll find that most clinicians prefer to clip the area before they um, carry out regional analgesia, particularly if they're going into a joint or a synovial structure. If they're going perineurally, um, it's less common to clip. Regardless of that, always ask your clinician before you start, do you want me to clip or not? If so, exactly where do you want me to clip? And then make sure you have permission from the owner before you do so because it will take quite a long time for the, the clipped hair to go back. This is a photograph I took of a horse um, that had had um, an injection into its coffin joint or its um, distal interphalangeal joint about two, week, two months previously. And you can see there over the, the medial side of the coronary band, um, beside that little dark patch, you can see this little area of clipped hair. So even though this was several um, weeks after the procedure, you can still make out the clip marks on the animal's hair coat. So they will take quite a long time for the hair to grow back. There you go. Um, in terms of where we deposit the local anesthetic, we have two main options. We can either go subcutaneously, which is perineural or around the nerve bundle, 
or we can inject our local anesthetic into a synovial structure. So the difference being is that the latter is much more invasive than the former. With a subcutaneous injection, even if we do inadvertently cause um, a, a local infection, it's unlikely to be, have any serious health consequences. It's obviously preferable to avoid it, but it's not a disaster if it occurs. Whereas intrasynovial infection is much more problematic. We talked about how specialized a structure the hyaline cartilage in the joint is and how limited ability it has to deal with infection. So we definitely want to avoid that. So what we will generally find is that for subcutaneous or perineural injection of local, we'll normally just prepare the skin as if we were given um, an intravenous or intramuscular injection. So we'll pick a part of the hair coat that's clean and dry and free of dirt. We'll soak the hair coat with isopropyl alcohol and then we'll put our needle through it subcutaneously. Whereas for an intrasovial injection, we're going to clip the hair off. We're going to put on sterile gloves or disposable gloves. We're going to perform a full aseptic scrub at the skin site. And then when we inject the structure with the local anesthetic, we're going to use sterile gloves, a new needle and syringe and unopened, previously unopened or un unused while of local anesthetic solution and so on. So we'll be much more conscious of being aseptic in the latter than the former. In terms of where we make these injections, um, it is important that you know your anatomy here, particularly of the distal limb, because that's where the majority of lamuses occur. So it is important that you clip or prepare the, the skin precisely over the structure. You want to deposit the local anesthetic around. I'm sorry, that's my watch alarm. Right, sorry about that. So if you're not sure exactly where to scrub, ask the vet. You're much better to check in advance rather than have them come back and realise, oh, you're not exactly preparing the site where I want to place the needle. So if in doubt, ask them to show you. Um, this is important as well. If you're going to place the needle at the site while the limb is in flexion, then you must clip and scrub the area in flexion. Otherwise, you'll end up with your clip patch away from where you want the needle to end up. So if we're doing it as part of a limb's examination, um, generally, we'll start off like we did the last day in class by trotting the horse and flexing it and moving it in circles and reversing it to figure out which limb is lame. Then we'll start blocking distally and we'll work proximally until the lameness improves or disappears. That's because the um, sensory supply to the limb runs from the central nervous system to the extremities. So if we started blocking the limb at the shoulder, we would just in one go anesthetize everything distal to that point. So if the horse went sound, we still wouldn't know where in the limb the problem was. Instead, we have to start down at the foot and work our way approximately until the limb is either improves or disappears. And then we know whatever we last blocked is the area where the pain was coming from. So it does, it does take time. It's a systematic process. You can't really take shortcuts in it and you can spend several hours at this with a, with a complex limb um, examination. It's really important for this reason to fill in the results as you go along. So you won't remember by the time you've done the 11th nerve block what the result of the first one was. So it's very important to just jot down as you go along. You'll have plenty of time to do this while you're waiting for the blocks to take, take place or to, to, take, to kick in. So do make a note as you go of what the results are. Right, so we'll start off with some examples. The first one I'm going to mention is the palmar digital nerve block. This is a really commonly performed um, subcutaneous deposition of local anesthetic around the digital nerves that supply the feet. So if, if you remember when we talked about digital pulses, we were palpating the palmar digital artery. There's a lateral one and the medial one that run down the limb over the proximal um, sesamoid bones here and over the side of the pastern and down into the foot. Running beside each palmar digital artery is a palmar digital nerve and a palmar digital vein. So we have vein artery nerve um, or van from uh, dorsal to um, palmar. So we want to, in this case, deposit our local anesthetic over the digital nerve. So we're going to place our needle tip um, on the palmar edge of that bundle of vessels we can feel underneath the skin. Okay. So our palmar digital nerve block is performed over the palmar digital nerve, just proximal to the lateral edge of the collateral cartilages, or just distal to the pastern or the proximal interphalangeal joint. So again, if your anatomy is a little bit vague on this, go back and revise the distal limb anatomy of the horse. 
There's two nerves. We make two injections, one laterally and one medially. We're putting one to two mils of local anesthetic subcutaneously over the palmar-digital nerve. We're waiting for five minutes, then we're trotting the horse. And if the animal goes sound, we know that the pain was coming from the heel region. So this block, when performed bilaterally, will basically anesthetize the caudal um, two-thirds of the foot. So the structures in the heel and the, the caudal two-thirds or palmar or plantar two-thirds of the foot will be anesthetized. Um, this is just another image showing you. So this is um, um, a view of the back of the horse's pastern. Our palmar digital nerve is running down the limb alongside the palmar digital artery. And we can see we're injecting um, local anesthetic here through a small needle over the nerve just proximal to the collateral cartilages. In terms of how you do it, um, you get someone else to restrain the horse. You can see this picture here in the lower right. The horse has been held by a handler who's on the same side as, as the person performing the nerve block. That's important. So if the horse does object and move away, this person holding them won't get squashed. The person holding the horse is also paying attention to what's going on. So that's really useful. So what you do is you wash your hands, dry them and put on a pair of disposable gloves, draw up one to two mils of local anesthetic in each of two syringes and then use a fine gauge needle. I like to use a 23 gauge 5 eighth of an inch needle. It's a very small volume. We don't need to use a large gauge needle and it's going to hurt less. Then what I like to do is um, pick up the limb. So I'll hold the limb in my non-dominant hand, in my case, my right hand, and then I'll detach the needle from the syringe and I'll push the needle into the skin over the palmar digital nerve. I personally find it's helpful if you press your thumb onto the site of injection for a second or two beforehand. If you firmly press the skin like that, you slightly deaden it and then pop the needle through the skin over the, the nerve. Most horses won't object to this at all. Um, it's, it's a very small needle and they generally tolerate it very well. I also find it helpful to block the medial side first because it's technically a bit trickier. You're working slightly further away from yourself. So if the horse does object the second time, you're doing the, the easier lateral side. So you inject your one, two mils of local anesthetic. You are close to the artery and the nerve. So if you do hit either of those blood vessels and blood appears in the hub of the needle, just redirect it slightly more caudal or palmarly to move the tip of the needle away from the vein or the artery and closer to the nerve. Then inject your local anesthetic and then leave the horse alone for four to five minutes to allow the nerve block to take effect. To check that it's taken effect then, what I like to do is making sure the horse can't see me. So get the person holding to cover the horse's eye and I'll just gently poke the skin over the heel bulbs with the um, end of a pen. So a blunt object. In a normal horse, as soon as you gently poke the coronet with the end of the pen, they'll move their foot. But if the block has taken effect, they won't feel you and they won't respond. So you can check laterally immediately to make sure your block has worked and then you go ahead and repeat your lameness examination, trot the horse up. If the lameness has improved, we know the discomfort is coming from somewhere in the region we've just blocked. You can also use this block, for example, if you want to suture um, a heel bulb laceration or do some, you know, debride a wound on the back of the pastern or something like that. So it's handy for other uses as well. Uh, really straightforward to do. The second nerve block I want to mention is the abaxial sesamoid block. This time we're blocking the same nerve. We're still blocking the digital ner um, nerve, but this time we're moving more proximally up the limb. We're blocking the nerve at the level of the proximal sesamoid bones, as, as the name suggests. This time we're going to anesthetize the entire foot and also the pastern joints. So instead of injecting low down over the collateral, collateral cartilage, this time we're going up here at the needle um, position mark D. We're injecting local anesthetic over the um, abaxial surface of the proximal sesamoid bones on the palmar or plantar surface of the metacarpo or metatarsophalangeal joint. Again, we can easily palpate this structure underneath the skin so we know where to direct our needle tip. And the procedure is exactly the same as we just described for the palmar digital or PD block. Again, a very useful block if you have to do anything to the foot, like suture a wound or put cast on or something. So handy one to keep in mind as well. And this illustration shows you where the needle goes this time. So you can see we're more proximal. We're over the level of the proximal sesamoid bones. And again, we have to do two injections, one laterally and one medially, to desensitize the entire foot and the pastoral region. But again, a very straightforward block to do. One to two mils of local anesthetic per site. 
through a fine needle. As I say, I prefer to use a 23 gauge 5 eighth of an inch needle for this. Um, it's kind of personal preference as to how you hold the limb, but this is how I like to do it. So um, having washed and dried your hands, I need to be wearing disposable gloves as well. This person isn't. I'm using my non-dominant hand or my uh, medial hand to palpate the blood vessel. And then I'm injecting the needle subcutaneously on the palmar or plantar edge of that blood vessel over the nerve. And then I'm going to inject, attach up my syringe, check I'm not in a blood vessel by drawing back and then injecting one to two mils of local anesthetic subcutaneously and then repeat on the opposite side. They're the two most commonly used nerve blocks in practice in my experience because so much of our lameness problems originate in the foot. There are other nerve blocks. I've put a list of them in the notes. I'll briefly mention a few of them here. And there's also a variety of books. So for example, um, there's a book called Guide to Equine Joint Injection, which is what it says. It shows you exactly where to put needles, what size needle to use. As you go up the limb, you're injecting larger volumes of local anesthetic. So we tend to use larger needle gauges and higher volumes. So there's lots of good guidebooks available that will talk you through it. Um, and as I say, if it's a nerve block you do every day, you get very familiar with it. If it's one you haven't done routinely, and you're not sure exactly where to prepare the skin, just ask your clinician to show you. It's better to, to check than realise, oops, I've done, done the wrong spot. So just to briefly mention some of the others, um, the low four point block is basically performed proximal to the sesamoid bones. This time we're going to desensitize the fetlock region as well as the pastern and foot. So we're injecting some local anesthetic between the suspensory ligament, which is shown in blue on this diagram, and the deep digital flexor tendon, which is shown in yellow. There's also a second um, nerve innervating this region, which is found just distal to the button or the distal end of the splint bones or the second and fourth metacarpal or metatarsal bones. So you can palpate that little button on the splint on the palmar plantar edge of the third metacarpal bone, and you're injecting about a mil of local anesthetic underneath that um, site to desensitize the nerve supply in the fetlock. Again, we have to do this laterally and medially, so that's why it's called a low four point block. Once you've injected each site laterally and medially, you've made four separate injections to desensitize the fetlock, the pastern, and the foot region. So, on, a, on an image of a horse, you can see um, this structure here. Running down the middle of the limb is the um, deep digital flexor tendon. Palmer to that is a superficial flexor tendon. The obvious kind of rod-like structure there that you can see dorsal to the red spot is the suspensory ligament. And then um, dorsal to the suspensory ligament is the third metacarpal bone or metatarsal bone in this case, or the cannon bone. So we're going to inject our local anesthetic into that space between the suspensory ligament and the deep digital flexor tendon where this red dot is on the image. Second injection site then is you can palpate the button of the splint and you're going to deposit a local anesthetic underneath that. So you can see you know, in a young flighty animal you're having to inject four times into their hind limb which they might not be thrilled about so this is where it starts getting a little bit trickier in terms of patient restraint and being careful not to get kicked. High four point is exactly the same anatomical landmarks as the low four point, it's just higher up the third metacarpal or metatarsal bone. So in this case, you're going to inject between the suspensory ligament and the deep digital flexor tendon, just distal to the um, carpus or tarsus, and you're putting a second blob of local anesthetic, just cranial um, to the suspensory ligament at the back of the third metacarpal or metatarsal bone. And that will desensitize everything below that, basically. So it will desensitize the metacarpal or metatarsal region as well as the fetlock, the pastern, and the foot. Other sites in the forelimb that we can inject are the radial and ulnar nerves. Um, it's rare that we would do these. We're basically giving the animal a kind of a dead leg. Um, we're injecting local anesthetic um, just off the caudal edge of the distal radius, and we're going more proximally onto the ulnar nerve between the cranial edge of the radius and the extensor muscles. And we're putting much larger volumes of local anesthetic in here, sort of between 10 and 20 mils per site. These nerves are quite big, so you've got to wait longer as well for the nerve block to take effect, maybe up to 30 or 40 minutes in some cases. They're not routinely done. Um, I've seen them used mostly in practice to anesthetize um, the limb for orthopedic procedures. 
while the horse under general anesthesia. We don't tend to use them all that much in um, lameness diagnostics in the conscious animal. Just so that you're aware that you can do them. I um, in the hind limb, the palmar um, digital becomes the plantar digital block. The abaxial sesamoid block is exactly the same as in the forelimb. When we look at our four point blocks, we find that we have an extra nerve that runs down the um, extensor tendon on the dorsal surface of the limb. So we have to make six injections instead of four. So here's our original site for a low four point, in this case, a low six point. We're going initially in between the suspensory ligament and the digital flexor tendon. We're going under the button of the splint. Sorry, that's the other way around. The first dot there. So first dot is under the button of the splint. Second dot between the suspensory and deep digital flexor tendon. And then our third um, injection per side is just off the lateral edge of the extensor tendon down the front of the cannon bone. Then we repeat that immediately to give a six injection sites instead of four. So you can see how at this point the animal can be getting a bit browned off and be trying to kick you. Same thing for um, a high six point, exactly the same anatomical landmarks as you've just described. We're just further up the metatarsal bone. Likewise, we can block the tibial and perineal nerves above the hock or the tarsus. Again, it takes up to 40 minutes for these blocks to take effect. The injection sites are just underneath the calcaneum tendon off the back of the tibia and between the extensor um, tendon or extensor muscle masses on the cranial or lateral edge of the tibia. One thing to bear in mind with this block is if it's worked, you'll know it's worked because the horse will start to knuckle forward and it'll be dragging the dorsal surface of its fetlock joint along the ground. So that's something to watch out for. It makes the animal stumble. Um, they can be a bit uncoordinated when this block is in place. You might want to put a boot on their leg or a little bandage to protect it. And you're, not, you're going to avoid making any sharp turns or circles with them. Again, I've mostly seen it used in practice to um, anaesthetize limbs for general anesthesia under surgery uh, rather than when the animal has been having a, a lameness examination. Um, just to mention one other block, um, a high suspensory block is a specific block that's used to diagnose pain in the origin of the hind limb suspensory ligament. So the suspensory ligament, remember back to your anatomy, it originates just distal to the tarsus or carpus on the back of the metacarpal or metatarsal bone and it runs down the back of the third metacarpal bone, divides in two at the level of the proximal sesamoid bones and then runs over the lateral edge of the pastern or the first phalanx um, in heading dorsally and it merges with the extensor tendon at the level of the proximal interphalangeal joint. So it acts like a shock absorber. If it gets strained or damaged, the animal can get pain where it originates off the back of the um, metacarpal or metatarsal bone. So to diagnose that, we can inject local anesthetic into that site. So we're picking up the limb to take the weight of the flexor tendon so we can push them out of the way. And then we're injecting local anesthetic into the proximal suspensory region. Right, that's um, all the nerve blocks I want to describe for the moment. They're the ones that are focusing on the subcutaneous or perineural anesthesia um, in the limb. They're the ones we tend to use both for lameness diagnostics and to allow us to do procedures on the limb, such as debride wounds or do orthopedic surgery and so on. And to recap on them, we're injecting the local anesthetic subcutaneously in most cases. So we're going to be aseptic. We're going to wash and dry our hands with disposable gloves. We're going to soak the hair coat at the site with isopropyl alcohol and we'll proceed as if we're given a subcutaneous intramuscular injection. But we're not going to be clipping the hair and performing a full surgical scrub. We'll generally reserve that for um, intrasynovial injections, which I'll talk about in the next lecture. So that's it on perineural analgesia for the moment. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the Moodle forum thread I'll put up for you. Okay, thanks very much.